Welcome to Hispanic Biz Success Stories. We engage in conversation with entrepreneurs who have built successful businesses to learn from their experiences, their triumphs, and their challenges. Every business has a story, stories of, of, of all kinds of issues that, that families go through, personal stories and business stories. Today, we're fortunate to have with us a entrepreneur who's built a very successful business, uh, Elisa Silvia Martinez, owner of Altamar Home Healthcare. Silvia, thank you so much for taking your time to share your story with us. Thank you. Let me ask about Altamar Home Healthcare. What what kind of business is that? It's home healthcare. It's it's um we make house calls to the home. We provide home nursing nurses that make visits at the home, and we also provide rehab. So we could provide physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy, and also home health aid visits, but primarily therapy and nursing visits. And you're a registered nurse? Yes, my background is in nursing. You have to have a registered nurse certificate to do that kind of business? Um, it's not required, but it it really, really does help because the, the background you need, that background, it's essential. How many employees do you have now? We have about, I would say about maybe 65 to 80, well, it depends, more like 60 on a, when it's slow and up to about 80 when we're real busy and in El Paso. And then we have about maybe 10 employees in Santa Teresa, New Mexico, and about four in the medical equipment company. You have three companies? Yes. The other two came from the El Paso office because they asked us, um, they kept asking me to serve that Sunland Park and Anthony, New Mexico, which is the outskirts. And I couldn't because uh, the, the boundary line it was, um, was just Texas. So I had to get another license uh, to do that. Wow, so you had to come. Yeah, but that was like after being in business for seven years then. That You're in El Paso. Yes. And uh, where, where did you grow up? In Isleta. Ah. <laughs> By the uh, old Bronco and Paso del area. So you remember the old Bronco head? <laughs> yes. I remember that. Mr. Jimenez made that. Yeah. Who? Mr. Jimenez, Luis Jimenez. Oh, really? He had a sign company. I remember <laughs> he made that. Uh, Luis Jimenez, the artist's father, made that. So we used to go by the Bronco a lot down mm -hmm. on Alameda. It's still there. Yeah. <coughs> so, so you went to... Uh, Elementary school? Yes, I went to Our Lady of Mount Carmel on East Letter, which is now the speaking rock. Right. And then uh, I went there from first to the sixth grade, and then I went to a public school, seventh and eighth grade, Paso del Elementary, and then East Letter High School from, for three years. I kind of like was in a hurry to graduate. I don't know why, but <laughs> I, I graduated in 1975. And you did that quick. You did that in, what, three years? Three years. Why did you want to get out? I don't know. It was, there was a lot of things going on. Um, one of the things that happened was that there was a, like some projects being built on Saragossa, mm -hmm. the Kennedy projects right in front of the, the, the cemetery. Right. And there was a, kind of a blending of cultures of people in the, the, from the valley that were just like, you know, worked on farms or the farmers and just everyday folks. And then here we had people from the projects and there was kind of a, a little bit of an unrest during that time. And I guess it kind of scared me and I, I just, okay. uh, they had, there was a, a lot of fights during that time. Oh, okay. and never mind what, uh, <laughs> and people used to smoke in the, <laughs> in the <laughs> even, auditorium. Even then. <laughs> even then. <laughs> so you're from a large family. Yes. Um, I have a total of 10 brothers and sisters, five wow. girls and five boys. Wow. And I, I had brought a picture of, one, of where we were in 1972 and 1973, and all of us are all together, and we lived in a probably a maybe 900 or 1,000 square foot house. Wow. All 12 of us. How many and to a bedroom? 
all the boys in one, all the girls in the other. My parents had their own. Uh, there was one little area that was like the, supposed to be a dining room, but we called that the, I guess now you would call that the launching pad. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the oldest one got to stay there because it was just small enough for a twin bed. Wow. And because uh, they were working, so they, they got the privilege of sleeping by themselves, <laughs> that little, tiny little area. Wow, and you're all close in age. Yeah, we well, were about a year and a half to two years apart. Almost. Are you in the middle? Right, in the middle. Okay. They're like 10 years older and 10 years younger than me. So out of high school, when would you, did you want to get out of the house or what would you, what'd you do? Um, I wanted to, out of high school, I wanted to go, I got like a scholarship and my mom was totally against it because uh, my older brothers and sisters, when, we, when they grew up, or when we all grew up, we had to get a job and help the family and help pay something, you know, the utility bill just to help my dad out because there were so many of us. And that was kind of the unspoken expectation. So when it would, came to be my turn, um, I got a scholarship and it was very difficult because my father worked all the time and my mom was, was home. And uh, trying to convince my mom was just, she wouldn't budge. Wow. Your father, what did he do? He worked, um, I had brought a picture of, of, he worked for El Paso Water Utilities and he drove one of those big blue trucks. Yes. And uh, we used to fight to take him his, his lunch in the morning. Uh, my mom, he'd, wa he'd go warm it up outside in the cold season and uh, he'd call in that he was reporting to duty and my mom would be busy making his burritos and his little thermos with coffee or whatever and so she'd like say okay now and go take it to your dad and we'd fight to take it to him because I don't know he was always he was such a nice man my father and what's your family name uh, Hernandez okay and your father had a whole career there with water utilities <laughs> yeah. wow. he did and what yeah. was uh, what did you learn from your father hard work hard work always I mean showing up on time and uh, which I had to learn I being a Hispanic <laughs> being a female I was like always oh, late and then it got to the point where I was like you know I had to be on time and that's my da that was my dad my dad was he never missed work he always you know he worked and then some he always signed up for overtime and I guess with 10 kids and your mother, uh, what was she like? What did you learn from your mom? My mom, I learned discipline, a lot of discipline. It was no, we, she ran our household like it was a small army. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't go to work, we couldn't go to school unless we um, had breakfast, number one. And number two, we had to put, make our beds and put away our dirty laundry. And that was a must. And all of us had to do it. If not, none of us went to school. So um, I had one brother that was too busy blow drying his hair to look like David Cassidy to. Uh. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> and so, so here you are with a scholarship, and your mother doesn't want to let you go. No. So how did what did you do? I had my sister who worked at UTEP. Her name was Margie Hernandez. She worked in the admissions office with Diana Guerrero. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah. And she was like, Sylvia, you can't let this, you can't let this go. And also my boyfriend who later on was my, became my husband, he was like, look, you, you have an opportunity that you can't just pass it by. And my sister said, you know, work on my dad. Work on my dad and then he'll get to mom. So I did. <laughs> and uh, since I finished year, um, a year early, uh, I told my dad, you know, just give me a chance. I wasn't going to finish anyway, and just give me a year. And if I'm, if I make a mistake, if this is, if this is a big old mistake, then let it be. But I was going to, wasn't going to be out of high school yet anyway. And uh, he said, well, okay, I'll give you a, I'll give you a chance. But let's see what your mom says. And I still remember the day that she was making tortillas on the 
kitchen, you know, counter, and because she made them hot every day. She was using the roller. It's just the rolling, <laughs> the rolling <laughs> pin to roll them, and and he said, just give her that one year, and and he goes, come on, and then she got the. She got the palote, the rolling pin, and she just threw it on the, the counter. She goes, okay, for the west, yeah. Leave me alone. <laughs> Why did she not want you to go to school? It, it was totally <laughs> against um, her expectations or her, her upbringing was that, um, that the women um, went to high school, grade school and high school, but they got married and stayed home with the kids. So to her, you know, why did you want to go to school for if you were just going to stay home, take care of the kids? You know, and this was my opportunity to help out before I got married and I was going to kind of like short change that opportunity and I was like, mom, but so her, to, in her mind, being a secretary um, or working at a bank was like a big deal. Uh, as far as like as a as a clerical person, and I said, well, I mean that's okay. I said that I, I would like to do that for a while, but uh, one of these days I'd like to be something more. And uh, it yeah. was just. So you went to UTEP. I went to UTEP. And what was your first major that first year? Oh, uh, I couldn't make up my mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. I went into nursing at first. Because my grand, my great grandmother was um, kind of like back in Mexico. She was a midwife, and um, kind of a not a curandera, but one of those people that makes like had the cures for stuff with using natural herbs and mm -hmm. and teas and stuff like that. And people used to come to her house to get massages when they hurt their back mm -hmm. or. You know, she was a sobadora. Sobadora, that's what she was. And yeah. I used to watch it when I was a kid. And really? I, and I, I wrote a paper in high school that I wanted to be a, I guess, a sobadora, a massage therapist yeah. or something. And my English teacher was like, come over here. I, I, re I read your paper, and why, why do you want to do that? And I explained to him, and he was like, you need to go to college, and you need to start now. Wow. And I said, oh, I don't want to go to college. My family's not going to let me. Yeah. And so. Now one time I, uh, I was a little kid and I broke my shoulder. And bro shoulder, I, f I forget what you call it. <coughs> and, and there was a, a salvador that mm -hmm. worked on horses and he straightened my, straightened my clavicle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he would just pull it. Mm -hmm. You know, a little pain, but it was interesting. How <laughs> they knew the bones. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, so your first year of college was okay. Yes. Yeah, I couldn't decide between uh, nursing and then education. And I went to education for a while. And I went in there long enough to realize that I really wanted to go into to nursing. And um, I had to do a paper on projecting for what the out job outlook would be in 20, 30 years. As, and they said because of the population control, the teachers would decrease, the need for teachers would decrease, but mm. you know, you're always going to have your sick yeah. and people are always going to get oh, older okay. and I thought, hmm, maybe I'll go back. Wow. <coughs> so you, you started UTEP in 75. Yes. It's interesting. I used to teach political science there in 74 and 75. Oh, really? Yeah. First, first year on uh, political science. So now the second year comes uh, and your mother lets you go back the second year? Yeah. Yeah. Because they were used to it now. And you were, <laughs> and you were doing well. Yes. I, uh, I actually went to go live with my sister, my big sister Margie. Okay. And that's how I got to school and came back. Okay. Okay. So uh, you went straight through? Mm hmm Yes. And I, I, I tacked on an extra year because of uh, I lost credit for the year that I took education. Okay. So what was your degree? I actually I ended up with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Okay, that was early. Uh, I still was 21 when I graduated. Wow, but that was a new program, a Bachelor of Science in, yes. in Nursing. Yes, 1980. Because it used to be Hotel Do was a three-year program. Mm -hmm. And when UTEP had it, you went in and mm -hmm. got the degree. Mm -hmm. So you were a degreed nurse. Yes, we did two years of uh, undergraduate and then two years of the actual hands-on direct nursing care. And then what'd you do, go, go, to, uh, go to work? I went to work the night shift at Providence in the intensive care nursery. Wow. 
You like working difficult things. <laughs> <coughs> you enjoyed that. That's I like the challenge. Uh -huh. I, I did a, like an elective, and um, they had very serious problems, and I found it challenging, and that's why I, and I, and I liked babies, and I, so that's why I, I went to apply there. So you go to work right out of uh, college, and um, uh, what, what, what takes place in your life at that time? Mm, a lot of sleeping. <laughs> yeah, because you work nights. I worked the night shift. Yeah. I worked the night shift and uh, until I got married. And then, uh, then I moved to Houston. We moved to Houston for m less than a year because my husband got accepted at dental school. And um, there was a big culture shock being outside of El Paso. It was the first time being away from family and uh, and Houston's a big city. Wow. And uh, I I worked 12-hour shifts and I didn't see him because I had to leave about like an hour before and then I wouldn't come home till an hour late you know because of the traffic so I worked like 14-hour days and he was stressed out. I was I was okay but just working all the time and he just thought you know what I don't so you had culture shock and then uh, all that work. So what, what resulted? You did a year? We came back. We came Both? back. Yeah. Did he yeah. drop out of, medical, out of dental school then? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And he became a nurse. Oh, really? Okay. okay. And uh, I think that kind of haunted him for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so you come back to El Paso to be with family? Yes. And of course, by that time, you know, it seems like the worst time that financially and like having to start all over again. That's when I found out I was going to have my first child. <laughs> and so I went back to work. And I worked at the hospital. It was, and then we, in 1983, I had my first son. And in 1986, I had my second son. You have two, two boys? Two boys. <clears throat> and um, so how long did you stay working in the hospital? 13 years. OK. So did you ever think about opening a business? No, I used to wonder, I used to, I used to want to help, you know, our parents, the parents that once we discharged the babies, there was no follow-up. They had been in intensive care and all of a sudden they said, okay, your baby's fine and go home. But there was always that phone call at the middle of the night and they'd say, my baby is real colicky or is fussy and um, is it normal? Is that okay? And we weren't really allowed to like give advice over the phone. So we would just, we would calm them down and say, well, what's he doing? He goes, you know what? We, at that time we used to have like the radio on because we were working. He goes, put the radio on. They, we always have it on at work. So they'd put the radio on and <laughs> things would calm them down. Really? Just wow. little things. Or they'd call and say, is it normal for them to spit up? And so I always felt like there was a need to follow, uh, especially the real severe kids. The, f the family needed that reassurance that they were on the right track. And I think that's what, th that kind of opened the door for home health, for, um, I didn't know like what you called it. And at the time, um, they had visiting nurses, but we didn't really use them that much in our, at the hospital. So you saw this need for children to have care afterward, mm -hmm. but you didn't know how to form it. No. So was that on your mind for a while? Yes, and then I, I, the last year or two, home health started pretty strong, and it was a new thing to send the babies home with a nurse to make a make a home visit and reinforce all the teaching that they had learned at the hospital. And a company locally called uh, Nurses Unlimited, they needed somebody, they wanted to start a pediatric program, and they, and I went to apply for it, and they sent me to Dallas to train. And I started with them for like three years. And I got to learn like from the ground up how to start a program. And um, my husband wanted to start a home health agency, but for adults. So he started seeing adults and then Eventually, I left that company and I started the pediatric program in his company. Okay. And then, uh, then from there, 
the pediatric program got really, started growing really fast, and they said, you know what, we, we want to separate um, the children from the adults, so th that's when they formed Altomar. What year did you start? Uh, 1999, okay. December of 1999. But you'd been doing some home health care before that? Yes, from 93 yeah. through, but through 95, 96, and then with, with my, my husband, we did the home health from 96 through, then in 99 we finally got our, our license to, for just the pediatric. But we do, we do adults also. But the beginning of Altamar was pediatric uh, care? Yes. Okay. And that requires nurses to go out, so you hired nurses to provide that service? Mm -hmm. and, and then children with special needs. And so we had to hire therapists that were really, that uh, see these children needed like speech therapy because they had, maybe they had Down syndrome or they had cerebral palsy. And then from there, I knew a lot of the ped pediatricians and they said, hey, well, can we send you this, uh, this cancer child that we just want to make sure the family's okay at home, mm -hmm. make sure everything's, mm -hmm. so it kind of like snowballed from there. Wow. So, all of a sudden you go from nursing to running a business. What's that like? <laughs> it's a whole different story. Because I knew what, um, what it was like with symptoms and with diseases and when to call a doctor or not. But with the business, it's like um, you have to really, really multitask. You really have to have, um, you have to grow the business, so you have to have some marketing people come in, uh, go out to the community and educate them and say, well, you know, we're here. And then you have to have, um, you have to have money, you have to have the finance, and I think that's where I, I lacked the most knowledge, was in the financial aspect. And, um, and then with the, uh, with the interpersonal relationships, not only uh, in the community, but also like in, in the work environment. Because when you're in the same room with, for 40 hours a week with like four, four people, sometimes they get on your nerves, <laughs> and, and sometimes not. So sometimes that was your staff, four people? Uh, yes. What, what kind of staff? Uh, there was a biller, uh -huh. uh, there was a receptionist, and then there was a nurse, and there was me. It was just four of us. And it was like my brother, <laughs> my brother, my and myself, and then the nurse, and then a, a biller. So when you started, how many nurses did you have on staff? Oh, probably started out with about four or five. And uh, because what happened was that one of the biggest needs that we did have was, uh, was what do we do with these babies that uh, are oxygen dependent on a ventilator, and they're costing the hospital lots of money, but they're stable. But they're high tech and they're medically dependent. Send them home when risk the the child, risk the you know that the the baby go back into the hospital. Or the state of Texas has a medically dependent children's program or the com comprehensive care program. And they figured out that if they pay a nurse to provide some support, maybe eight hours a day, uh, seven days a week for a child that's on a ventilator or maybe even more hours, they can keep that baby or that child well, well enough to stay home. And it saves them a lot of money uh, in the long run. And that's one extreme. The other, the other is that just the IV antibiotics just to finish off, like say they have a real bad pneumonia and they need to, like 14 days. But so we, we could do IV therapy at home or it could be, um, so we, we had about five and now we have about 25 nurses. In, in, in uh, pediatric care? Yes, and then we have about, we have more than, we have uh, probably about 10 that work with adults. Back to the, to the financing, how did you, uh, how did you, did you learn the financing, the numbers? <laughs> yeah, the law, I had, well, you know, we had, a, I had an accountant and cash flow projections, things like that. They had to explain to me like I was a little kid so that I could understand that I had to stay within the budget. And uh, financing, um, 
we ran into some difficulties when we had some computer glitches and we didn't have the funds to like to do business um, because they owed it to us, but because there was a change in systems, um, then we had like this small period where you got to have your little cushion in the bank for those kind of times. And uh, you learn the hard way. <laughs> so. so cash flow then becomes uh, an issue. Yeah. And, and, and payroll. Becomes payroll. Because now you have to pay people on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, so did that bring stress? Lots of stress, yeah. And how did you deal with that? I prayed a lot, that's for sure. I sure did. And I did have family that helped that um, I took a loan out from the craziest thing. <laughs> it's funny, but my father-in-law was going to buy a, a, a used car, and he wanted to pay for it cash, and he was trying to get the guy to go down on the price. But anyway, and I had this cash flow problem, and my, my husband said, well, we can ask my dad, but good luck. Parting with money from him is going to be, it's going to take some work. And I had to promise him that I would pay him as soon as the glitch was over. And he, he had, he had the, that full amount at home and he handed it to me. <laughs> it sounds funny, but you know those, he's so cheap. <laughs> I thought I was so cheap. He's, he knows he's cheap, so I can say it. He had it inside a tortilla, you know, those Ziploc things where you, when you buy the tortillas from the store. He had it all in there and I'm like, I had to go to the bank, and so anyway, he helped me with the money, and he go to the bank, and it smells like, the money smells like tortillas. That's, fant that's fantastic. <laughs> but that was the money you needed. Yeah, I needed so, them. So family helped you through that period. Yeah, but then I, I, I did have to take out like a, um, what do you call it, a... A working capital loan? Yeah, it's a, a line of credit. A line of credit. And one of my clients at the time I was going, I hear all of a sudden my business was growing I, and I didn't have enough staff so I was doing some of the, the office and then nurse and then doing some of the visits and I, I had a person that was, um, I had to give her treatment in the morning and in the evening. It turned out to be that her husband was uh, one of the guys from um, Bank of the West. Oh, so in, in building your home health care business now, uh, one of the challenges that you've shared with us is is the issue of knowing the finances and then keeping cash flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you had a computer glitch that you didn't have money for. Was that, uh, was that like a year 2000 glitch or was it just the <laughs> system was not? Um, it, was, it was more like in, two, I guess it was in 2002, around there, 2001, 2002. Yeah, it was one of those. Um, they changed you know, the, the platform, and I didn't understand it at the time, but they, um, one platform didn't merge with the other one, and as a result, you know, m beyond our control, okay. our, our segment of business was not recognized. And okay. we were doing everything, you know, correctly. It was just a little problem. So the software <coughs> program was, yeah. was different and, and used a different platform. Um, so, so you had to change platform. And it wasn't on our part, it was on a, the state's part. Oh, the state changed uh, the, the way. Sta <laughs> the uh, state changed. That's the way you reported your CPT codes and yes. the way you did the billing. Mm -hmm. And the state, uh, so we, it was an insurance company th in Austin and uh, we had been doing business all along just fine and, and it was really frustrating because it's like we're doing, it's not us, it's Something on their end. So you had to buy new computers. Um, they had to like rewrite the script oh, for them I to um, allow our claims to go through. And once they did that, but that took their software people to to you know troubleshoot that. It took them about two or three weeks, and uh, you you need to. Ha and that was one of our main. You know, we we just had all our all our eggs in one basket, and that was a problem. So you had no cash flow for that. <laughs> <coughs> wow. But uh, we had some private insurance and some Medicare, and then all of a sudden we, we like, okay, let's get, 
um, let's try and collect on these other things because we need something desperately now. So you're able to borrow from your father-in-law? Yeah, but we need it. We needed, we needed to have a solid plan B, which was establish a line of credit with an institution so that we could have it in times of crisis like that. And um, like I said, I was saying that he was one of the, the bank, um, one, of the, one of the main people at the bank. And he had said, I'd like for you to come and meet me and see what I do. And he goes, but you don't have time because you're here at you're here at my house at nine o'clock at night, <laughs> and it was like I, anyway. Um, he sent a loan officer to my business, and they, we filled out all the applications at my business. I had no idea that they could do that. Okay, you you were taking care of one of the bank officers. Uh, his his spouse. Okay, and so he got to know about your need and had mm -hmm. the bank come and mm -hmm. take care of you. So. Uh, so the bank relationship grew from a personal relationship, okay. and and so was the bank helpful. Yes, they were very very helpful. They ended up. Um, I did. I wasn't aware of programs that were available. They they told me about the SBA, Small Business Administration, that I qualified for an SBA loan. That I, you know, I just had to, you know have forms filled out and they needed to talk to my accountant so they could see what my cash flow was like and what my accounts receivables were like and um, <coughs> they told me within a you know it, it's it's a process it takes a couple of weeks and but once you're in you're in and you have that that you know that comfort that you can if, if you kind if you have uh, encounter you know some stressful times like that that you've got something to draw from and the importance of planning ahead and trying to get um, a reservoir of cash available so that allowed you to have cash available for mm -hmm. payroll for things that you needed yes from the bank and mm -hmm. and then you paid them back as as, mm -hmm. as you, your cash came in mm -hmm. <coughs> so so you didn't have to have all that cash no no so you've been able to maintain the line credit all this time with the same bank? Yes, yes. Wow. So you take care of that. <laughs> yes. They're, they're good to you. Yes. So your business began to grow. Mm -hmm. How did it grow? What, what, uh, and that was one of the things that uh, I think uh, the, it grew a lot from um, like relationships that we had with the physicians and with our clients, with our patients, and then always treating people like the way we wanted to be p treated and also like as if they were a member of our own family. You know, my father was pretty sick, and he passed away when he was 54. Oh, yeah. And um, before that, he had to have, um, he had diabetes, we didn't know that. We ha he was the first person who had it in our family. Uh, consequently, he, by the time he got care, the damage was already done, and it was very advanced, and he was actually kind of in failure. And so he ended up in, um, losing three of his limbs, wow. both, leg, uh, both arms and a leg, and um, he ended up on dialysis three times a week. Were you a nurse at that time? <laughs> well, I was going to nursing school, but I really wasn't prepared, you know, with, I didn't have the background for what he was going through. And as a result, you know, I could identify with, we weren't, we weren't poor enough because my parents owned their home in the Lower Valley. And it was a modest home, but they owned it. So we didn't qualify for Medicaid because at that time it was, and I'm not sure, they said, well, you can always sell your home for the cash. And then, but we weren't rich enough to pay for all the medical care and attention that he needed. And so it, it, it took about almost two years before he, we could, you know, get him certified as disabled. Wow. And I always have that background where they call us, and as a result, we see a lot of clients through University Medical Center, and it's uh, through their indigent care. And the state has funds, or the city has funds, for people that come in with no insurance, no coverage, and they tell us up front. And one of the things that helped me was, since I did have a background in, in teaching, when I was at the hospital, we had to do a lot of discharge teaching before we let the, the children go home. So they, they required us to teach, train, and get out. 
so, but they guaranteed the funds, but we had a small number of visits to do it. So, so your own experience sensitized you to the needs of your clients. Mm -hmm. How do you communicate that to your team? Oh, it's essential. It's essential that they understand that they have to treat people like it was somebody in their own family because it, it, one of these days it will be. And if not, then we're really not a good fit. You know, because um, I've had, when I get the phone call from a doctor and saying, you know, I, um, I just talked to one of the most, the rudest person over the phone. And that's the person that, you know, it's, it's, that's the yeah, first impression of the company is the person who answers the phone. And it, and it was a, uh, it was a nurse, it was a male nurse that he didn't know who he was speaking to. And she said, and she said, I, I want to be, I need you to uh, pay attention and I, I need you to, you know, expedite this as soon as possible. And he was, he just told her, you know, well, take a number, you know, and just. <laughs> was that a competitor? Uh, no, he, he was, he actually worked for me. Oh, my. <laughs> and so she called me up and he oh, said, he was so rude. I see. And I said, I had to call him in and I said, did you, did you say this? He goes, yeah. And I go, did you know that's Dr. So-and-so? She has sent us so many referrals. And he was like, oh. and I said, mm -mm. I said, we're not, we are not a good fit. Oh, you, you don't treat people like that. Wow. And um, so what did you do? I had to let him go. <laughs> Yeah. There, there's certain things that you, they're deal breakers. It's just not going to work. So what were the challenges you faced in growing your business? I mean, you, you didn't have a business background. Um, the marketing, going out, you know, and putting yourself out there and um, networking with the community. And you're having, a, having to do a lot of cold calls, like with the hospitals, with the discharge planners, with the social workers. Um, that was part of it. And the other one is educating the staff on how to do what they're doing better. And I realized kind of the hard way that it really pays to educate your staff, to send them to billing seminars, to send them to nursing seminars so they can get better at their craft. And you don't think you can afford the people to, to go for a day or two, but you have to because in order to stay with all the changes, uh, your staff's got to be, you know, in tune with what's the, the latest and greatest way to do things. So here you are, CEO of your own business, and um, as a woman, what obstacles did you face? <laughs> a lot of that's, um, I think as a, it was a lot of um, pros and cons. The, the pros about home health is that you can set your own hours as far as when you're going to see the patients as much as you can. Um, um, but then there's a lot of guilt too because if, you, if you're a working mom, um, a working woman, the, the responsibility to take care of the family kind of rests on you. So you need, when your children are sick, you've got to stay home and that's one of the challenges. How about the respect? Oh, the respect. That's all. You don't get, as a woman, it's, I, I've had to have people do work at, at, the, at the office or they come in looking for the boss and, uh, and they say, they, they, they say, well, you need to talk to Sylvia. And then they'll all see me walking around and then I'll say, well, go over there and I'll, I'll be with you. And it's like, it's a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I was telling a story about how I needed some electrical work and, I told the guy, you know what, I need some, I need, you know, we came in, we we're having a lot of out of, you know, we need like a power breaker or something, circuit breaker, because uh, something was going on. And anyway, I called an electrician and he didn't want to talk to me. No, he just like, made me talk to the boss. <laughs> wow. And like, so I tell the same, I tell, I tell the, my accountant, go talk to him and tell him all this. Mm. Uh, or the director of nurses that was a, a man at the time, hey, word for word, okay, si senor, si senor. Right. But like he just totally ignored me. You know, it's like no respect. <laughs> and and so did you? Did you also, uh, being a Hispanic woman, was was that a factor? Well, no, those are the yeah, that is definitely a factor. How does how does it play? 
Well, a lot of it too. Um, I think not so much in El Paso, but um, when I've gone into Austin, um, there's not a lot of Hispanic business owners when you when everybody's there. There's a lot of um, different ethnic, um, you know, the people from different ethnic backgrounds. But for Hispanics, there's there's a very small number, and uh, it's starting to pick up. But as a woman, when I was there, it was like, you know, I, I remember working in Houston at the hospital, and and they were going to do heart surgery on a, on a kid, and they were looking for somebody to interpret, and they were going to ask a. There was somebody that was registered as an interpreter, but she was also happened to be the cleaning woman, and I thought we can ask her. I can do it, and I'm like, oh. that was like. I'll explain the procedures, and they thought you know Spanish because as you go further in in Texas and Houston yeah. and stuff, you we have less Spanish-speaking right. Hispanics. So. Wow! So that's been an asset in the. In the yes. Space. So what's next for your business? One of the things uh, we expanded to New Mexico for that underserved area between Las Cruces and and El Paso, which is uh, Santa Teresa, um, Anthony. Sunland Park, Chaparral, Alvado, Perino, and um, then as a result of that, we, my son started um, a medical equipment company. I right? just helped just a little bit in the, and kind of like steering him on where he needed to go for uh, how to submit paperwork and everything, but he's done it all by himself, but it's, we provide hospital beds, oxygen, walkers, wheelchairs, things like that. So you, you're just expanding in terms of client base. Mm -hmm. In services, you're pretty well, mm -hmm. pretty well set. And I think we're also moving into the, um, from paper to uh, the paperless system, which is another big challenge for. Yeah, electronic medical records. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. And uh, that's gonna be, we're in the process of doing that this year. And other, other agencies have done it, but I, you know, you have different, um, backgrounds for people and some of the older people, older nurses and therapists, they're a little bit less, they're more reluctant to, to get on board. Whereas you have the younger people, they just catch on so quick. So tell me, in, in growing a business, what, what are the biggest challenges you've had to overcome? Um, some of them have been the uh, I have a lot of family members that work within my fam within my business, and um, when we started the business, it was my husband and his brother, and we took out a loan from his wife. Well, my br my brother-in-law's wife was the um, ex-wife of the guy from the Oakley Sunglasses. Oh wow! <laughs> and. Um, when they mentioned that they wanted my wanted to start a business. Uh, she was about to marry my brother-in-law, and she handed them a check with in both of their names for $150,000 cash, you know, wow. from her personal checking account. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that was nice. Yeah, that was nice until they had a disagreement. And uh, I think that really taught us a big lesson as far as... What kind of a lesson? Well, on mingling, you know, business and family, and how because of misunderstandings and um, expectations that are met or not met, um, people get upset. And, and it's hard when it's uh, two brothers, and it's, it's, it's hard, it's difficult when it's, even I have a sister and I have several nieces um, that and nephews or cousins that like work, but it seems like the further away they are um, removed, they they sort of respect you more, and your aunt so and so, so they keep their distance and they're pretty submissive. But I think that there's you know sibling rivalry and conflict, whatever issues you had growing up, they really intensify in the in the work environment, and uh, yeah. It's so do you have a policy now, or do you just <laughs> you just ride the waves? We ride the waves. I think um, it, it, it caused a break in their relationship with my 
uh, with my husband and his brother. But after a couple of years, they were able to talk again. But it, it, it really scarred their relationship. Well, that was, because that was money that was involved. Yes. Oh. And uh, with my own family, it's more, uh, I'm very flexible, but I don't like people taking advantage of, I'm flexible. And that one is one of the things with the being an, a working mom or a female, having to come in a little bit late uh, because you have to take your children to school or they call you suddenly and you have to go home. That's one of the things that, you know, you have to understand that, you know, family's first. Of course, now your children are grown. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so what's your future? What's the business future? <sighs> my, my goal in the next five to 10 years is to grow the business into a healthy, healthy enough to where I can put it up for sale and use that money as a retirement. And also at the present time, uh, my children are 26 and 29, and they've wanted to go into their own business. So like my older one is doing the medical equipment company, and my younger one is kind of a artistic free, free spirit. <laughs> and he's, he's doing like t-shirts and he's doing uh, vid small videos for people like for weddings and sometimes for like when somebody's having a baby or capturing the moment for you know parties or a lot of these little social medias everybody wants a like yeah. a little video for their Facebook. Wow so. that's neat that's neat. So so what's the what would you say to someone that's starting a business today in your similar circumstances. Uh, you're a professional, you're technical, uh, you see a need, you want to go out there and start a business. What would you, what would you tell them? They, had to have, they need to have a lot of passion and endurance. And um, there's going to be times when they're going to get discouraged and that they, if this is something they really believe in, that they really need to educate themselves on, in, their weak, in their weak spots. And uh, we all have weaknesses that we have to recognize and work on that. But also remember what it's gonna cost you. And, and the thing is that your family needs to come first because I would really hate to be a success in my business but be a failure with my own family. That was a fundamental principle you built your f mm -hmm. business on, mm -hmm. and you adhere to that. So, so in building your family now, you didn't sacrifice. Uh, you didn't sacrifice your family, but you didn't sacrifice the business either. How did you do that? Um, you know, it's it's the I think sometimes, out of the mouth of babes, is the truth, you know, and wisdom too. It's like, well, you have time for everybody else. And what about me? Yeah. You know, what about when I'm sick? And it's like, okay, sir, you're right. You know, well, what am I doing rushing off to this when my own, my own kid is sick? I need to spend time with him. So yeah. you made choices. Yes, and, and that was one of the choices that leaving the hospital was, um, that's what made, I, I really loved my job at the hospital. I, it was exciting, it was, I had been there a long time, but I knew it got to the point where, you know, I couldn't leave right at three o'clock because my shift was over. If I had a, if I had a patient that was going, um, whose condition was deteriorating, so I had to stay sometimes and I would miss something special. And you can't take that moment back. Because a lot of times when there's like school functions, graduations and births, they're not, it's just a moment in time. And you can't miss that because you're busy doing something else. And believe me, and if you do, you will be haunted by it or reminded of it by either your child or your spouse the rest of their lives, you know? So, so have the rewards of business been worth it? Yes. What are the rewards of having a business? Uh, I think the, the rewards are, are 
there's a lot. <laughs> but I think that w the, one of the biggest rewards is that is doing things uh, your way and also being able to help other people and also being able to bless your family and and other people. And, and you have to stick to your, you know, if you're good at that one thing, you know, really, really polish that too. Because uh, we tried another business, which was the restaurant business and. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. Why did you get into restaurants? Because oh, it looked easy, but it wasn't. <laughs> So you diversified it. Yeah, that was that was a big mistake. <laughs> and we lost a lot of money, and I was like, yeah. you know what? My gift is in healthcare, and and it wasn't even. It was my sons were with it, were in the business with their dad, and I was trying to be encouraging, and then it was like, wow, it it, it did miserable, and it, it was like, you know what? We're really good nurses. <laughs> We need that's to stick the, with that. So the saying comes, cada cocinero a su cocina. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, yeah. you know, each each cook to his own kitchen. Yes. Um, and but but your growth is in your in your field now, and so I guess in growing your business now, what is the chief skill or attribute that you've gained owning your business now that you didn't have before and may not have without business? I, I would say that um, I, that. As a nurse, I was a really good nurse, but with the, with my business, I've really had to be a good coach. You have to be a coach to all the members in your in your workplace, starting from the people in the the file room to the people who answer the phone, to the people who bill, the 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 nurses and the therapist. And, and you have to be a co good coach in that, you know, you have to encourage them to do the best job that they can because you, you run into difficulties where they're not doing what you expect and you think, you know what, I know you can do this. Yes, you can. You can be timely. You can turn your paperwork in. I think that's the biggest, um, I think that's been the biggest challenge and the biggest skill that I've gained is trying to motivate people to to get on board and saying, you know, I don't mind if you're late. You know, 8.30, it's despite the cutoff, even though we started at 8 o'clock. 8.30, after 8.30, you know what? You know what, mister, you don't show up at 9.30 in that call. You know, and that's kind of the challenge or where it's like, do you really, you know, ask yourself, do you really want to work here? Because if you don't, that's okay. There's a the door, you know, but. So you've had to be firm. Yeah, because, you know, and I always tell them, you know, the day comes when you're outside in the parking lot and you're saying to yourself, uh, I don't want to go in there. I just don't like those people. I don't like my job. Go ahead and leave. It's time for you to go because you're you're miserable and you're making everybody else miserable. And uh, I, I saw that in my own self in the job I had um, in the home health care business before we went into our business. And because uh, we worked in corp with a, a corporate company and these people were out in Dallas and they were making demands and demands and they, they had no idea of what, what it was like to be in the field. Right. So you're really hands on. You really know your business and your people and you work with them and you know their moods <laughs> and their ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And um, you feel secure now in your business? More than I have in the in a long time, yeah. But and there's always changes. And you have a good team. You have a good team, yes. Well, your story is fascinating. You know, you, uh, you, you've done a, a, a beautiful job in building a business uh, the last 14 years. Uh, well, 14 years of, of, of Altomar, but you had some years before that. Uh, With the AM Healthcare. <coughs> oh, was AM. My, okay. AM Healthcare was my husband's business. Okay, <coughs> okay, and that's still around. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I think there's some some lessons uh, that you shared, you know, that are that are that are valuable lessons. Uh, I like the the concept of coaching a lot. I think the uh, the business owner has to put that team together, mm -hmm. and uh, and you're sharing that brings that brings that out very well. Um, you certainly seem to carry the legacy of your father and your mother and what you do, the discipline and <laughs> and and. Uh, 
the discipline that your mother had in, in, in the home and, and your father had in getting to work uh, because owning the business is a lot of work and you're not afraid of that. But you were able to pursue your passion in nursing mm -hmm. and build a business. Yes. So you feel satisfied. Yes. Well, I think it's a beautiful story you shared and I really, really appreciate that. I learned a lot and I trust that our, our viewers have enjoyed uh, listening to your story and you have made a big contribution to this community. We really thank you for that. So thank you for your time. So we really appreciate that. And thank you viewers for watching the show and hope you found this interesting and inspiring. So thank you very much and good day.